There are 129 active volcanoes in Indonesia, the world's largest archipelago nation. The country sits on an arc of volcanoes and oceanic trenches. Back in the early 80s, a large eruption on the most populous island of Java released a huge volcanic cloud, unseen and undetected by high-flying aircraft, and so a major hazard. Not everyone has the chance to fly somewhere in an aeroplane. For those who do, it's usually a pleasant experience. They say getting there is half the fun. On long journeys in a plane, the meals are usually good, there are in-flight movies, and if you're lucky, you might meet some interesting people. Fortunately, aircraft accidents are few and far between. Imagine what it is like to be faced with the prospect of not completing your journey of being lost in some unknown place, not saying goodbye to those nearest to you. Some years ago, I spoke with Bill Morris, a resident of the United Kingdom. Bill was on his way to Australia in a large jet, and when it was flying over Indonesia, some rather nasty problems developed. British Airways Flight 9, a Boeing 747 Jumbo, the city of Edinburgh, en route from Kuala Lumpur to Perth, altitude 35,000 feet. 9.30 p.m. Western Australian Standard Time, 239 passengers on board. As the passengers are getting ready to watch the movie on Golden Pond, there's a slight thud as the aircraft flies into a vast, thick volcanic cloud. All four engines lose power as they choke with volcanic ash. The captain decides to put his jet into a high-speed, powerless descent in order to restart the engines. Both the captain and crew have done it all before on a simulator, and they go about their duties without any panic. The cabin crew immediately start their emergency procedures, making sure all passengers have their oxygen masks on and are strapped in. They have to struggle along the aisles of the massive jet. They do their job efficiently and with perfect calm, despite the fact that death could only be a matter of minutes away. The pilot informs his passengers of the trouble. This is your captain speaking. We have a small problem. All our engines have stopped. We are doing our damnedest to get them working again. I trust you're not in too much distress. One of the passengers is Bill Morris of Eccles. It's his 21st birthday, a birthday he'll never forget as long as he lives. Well, the stewards and stewardesses had just uh, cleared away our meal things, and we were just settling back to uh, to watch the in-flight movie, which is going to be on Golden Pond, I think. And uh, I heard a, a dull thud, which seemed to come from outside the fuselage, and then gradually the atmosphere within the within the cabin got smokier and smokier. At first I thought it was cigarette smoke, and then it got much thicker, and my reading light was sort of diffusing down through it like a cinema beam. And uh, I began to go rather numb and rather panicky at the thought of what was going on. Could you notice that the engines had stopped at this time? No, I didn't notice that at the time. It was all happened in about uh, 30 seconds later. Um, the plane started bucketing around all over the place. Um, the oxygen masks fell from the ceiling. There were a few screams. The nose dropped and you had that horrible feeling like when you go down very fast in the lift. Uh, it was very frightening by the tension on people's faces. Uh, there was no physical panic, but uh, there was quite a lot of screaming. How long before the captain made his now famous announcement about the engines failing? I should think it was about five or six minutes into the actual dive. Obviously his, uh, his mind was contained with other things at the time, like keeping the plane in the air probably. Um, it wasn't for quite a while. We were kept in the dark. No one knew what was going on. The stewards and stewardesses, obviously just as ignorant as ourselves about the situation. Um, the plane was obviously going down at a terrific rate. Uh, there was a lot of vibration, noise, um, a lot of turbulence, and you could easily tell that we were losing altitude very quickly. What were the thoughts going through your mind? Did you think that that was it for you? Yes, I did. I thought I was going to die. Um, I actually quickly grabbed a piece of paper from my flight bag and wrote a message to my parents and my girlfriend, sort of saying my final farewell. Um, I also grabbed my passport, which is attached to a money belt, and strapped it to my waist, thinking that they might identify my body later. It sounds dramatic on retrospect, but at the time I really thought I was going to die. What about the passengers close to you? Uh, there was a woman next to me, an old old lady, um, Australian woman. She kept repeating to herself over and over again that she didn't want to land in the sea because she couldn't swim. She was very, very frightened. I held her hand and smiled at her and made a sort of joke with the oxygen mask by placing one over my mouth and one over my ear and pretending it was a telephone. It's, she smiled a little, but uh, we were very, really, really petrified. 
Was it anything like the airport movies where we see a lot of panic among the passengers? No, it wasn't. Uh, the airport movies, they seem so tame. Uh, there was one on the television not so long ago and it seemed so tame compared to what we all went through. It happens much faster. Uh, tension is on a very high key. There's no conversation. We were petrified. Uh, you become numb, sort of paralysed, because uh, your destiny is in the hands of someone else. You can't control it at all. It's said that when anybody's in such a situation as you were, that uh, their past life flashes in front of them very quickly. Did that happen to you? Uh, no, it didn't, but uh, other things did preoccupy my mind. I was, uh, I was thinking of how my parents would take the news of my death. It's impossible to gauge the reaction of someone hearing about your death, actually. Um, I thought of how my friends would uh, take the news of my death. Um, it sounds very dramatic on retrospect, actually, but at the time, these are the things that go through your mind. I also was preoccupied for a little while about uh, how painful it was going to be when we actually hit something, um, but I tried to get that, that out of my mind as far as possible because uh, it began to worry me somewhat. How did the crew behave? The crew, obviously, in not knowing what was going on, kept to strict procedures. They were excellent, fantastic. Uh, a lot of old people looked like they were going to have strokes or heart attacks, um, the crew were being kind to them, smiling at them, reassuring them as best as possible, because although the crew were obviously very, very scared themselves, they did keep an air of professionalism and kept to the strict safety procedures. Um, they were very good. It must have been very hard for the crew to move around with an aircraft in, in a very steep dive. Yes, Steve, it was. The, the plane was about 40 degrees, I should think, off lateral, so it was going down pretty quickly, and the crew were having to use the backs of seats to climb up the aisles to quite a great extent because they had oxygen bottles strapped to their backs with extra oxygen for the passengers who looked like they needed it. Um, a lot of women with small children and babies were very, very panicky. They needed the extra oxygen, I think, to calm them down. Was there any other form of reaction among the passengers who were obviously distressed? <laughs> People seemed to get religious all of a sudden. Um, there was quite a lot of uh, religious talk banding about, especially from some of the older members of the passenger crew. Um, people were sort of saying Jesus and oh my God and the silent prayers were being said obviously all around me. Um, but there was a general clamour that, uh, that tended to kill all conversation or any attempts at conversation. The noise of the aircraft was quite severe at one time with sort of the screaming wind and it seemed like it was going to break up, rocking all over the sky and a horrible feeling. Well, how did this jumbo jet come to be in a volcanic cloud in the first place? Well, there hadn't been any volcanic activity in that area for several years, I'm led to believe. And this volcano had erupted uh, 90 minutes before our incident. Um, and volcanic ash, evidently, is, is transparent on radar. It's totally invisible on radar. It looks just like a normal cloud. And so as it was at night, and um, our plane was travelling at 500 miles an hour, the pilots uh, just assumed that this, this sort of... A cloud in the distance was just a normal cloud made up of water droplets rather than volcanic ash. So he had no idea he was hitting a solid wall. No, you were cruising at around 35,000 feet, is that right? That's right, there and, it is, And yes. the engines didn't restart until 12,000? 12, 12,000, 11,500 feet, yes. That's where we levelled out, yes, that's right. And it took 12 minutes to go down? 12 minutes, yes. It, uh, it seemed an eternity at the time. Um, when you don't know what's happening because it was at night, all we could see were the flames pouring out of the engines... Um, the general smoky atmosphere. We knew something was desperately wrong, uh, but the time seemed an eternity, it really did. You saw flames coming out of the engines. Can you tell us exactly what they were like? Yes, the first, um, the first sign of flames was I heard a loud scream from behind me. I looked over the back of my seat and a woman by a window had just noticed these orange-red flames pouring past the window. Um, she slammed the blind shut, as did all the window passengers, because I don't think in that situation you really want to look at how you're breaking up, as it were. Where were you sitting? I was sitting in the centre aisle, and in, but in an aisle seat, so I wasn't too far from a window and I could see what was going on outside. Um, but as I said, as soon as the flames started coming out of the engines, people slammed their blinds shut, not wanting to see what was going on. Could you hear the engines being restarted? Yes, you could definitely hear engine noise, although we couldn't hear them being restarted. Uh, in the heat of the situation, I think your senses are numbed and, and your reactions be tend to become much slower. Everything seemed like it was happening in slow motion. Um, so we didn't realise the engines had started until we'd levelled out, I don't think. Uh, your, your senses re returned to some kind of normality and you realised that uh, you could be in with a chance of making it. And obviously spirits rose noticeably when we levelled out.
we didn't realise the engines had started until we'd levelled out, I don't think. Uh, your your sensors re returned to some kind of normality and you realised that uh, you could be in with a chance of making it. And obviously spirits rose noticeably when we levelled out. Now, the captain managed to start three engines, but I understand that one failed after that. Yes, we, we levelled out and... Uh, by the feeling in my stomach, I gathered that we hadn't we we had stopped losing height so quickly, um, but suddenly there was a a sort of spraying sound from outside. That's the only way I can describe it. And uh, we noticeably lost altitude again, quite dramatically. And evidently, I'm given to believe that this is when the third engine did pack up, and that left us with two. So you were cruising at around about eleven and a half thousand feet on two engines, and the mountains where you were going, or oh, there are mountains in the way, aren't there? Yes, Which there are. are higher. Yes, um, the mountain range is 11,500 to 12,000 feet high and the pilot, we only heard later, obviously we didn't know what was going on at the time, um, but later we heard the pilot was flying the aircraft by dodging the summits of these mountains. Um, very clever, especially when your windows are all blacked out. The windows were in fact sandblasted by the volcanic ash, so he was flying blind, just flying by radar and controls. You obviously had to make an emergency landing at the nearest airport, which was Jakarta. Which was Jakarta. What were you told about that? We were told over the grapevine, the stewards and stewardesses were gradually given the information by the flight deck that we were going to make an emergency landing, or as they said, crash landing at first, in Jakarta, uh, 20 minutes away. Um, spirits noticeably rose when we heard this information because it was good to hear that we actually we had a chance of getting down. Um, but during that 20 minutes, the plane was thrown about in the sky, something rotten, and uh, the tension on the people's faces was uh, was not a picture to see at all. Were there any light-hearted moments in this drama? Yes, there were. Um, when the plane did right itself, um, an Australian couple behind me who had been having a very good time on the plane before the incident, um, quite a little party in fact. When you say a good time, what were they doing? Well, celebrating? They were, they were making the most of the British Airways complimentary drinks um, and uh, celebrating, yes, I think they'd had a party before they left and uh, when the incident occurred, they shut up immediately and there was absolute silence. I hadn't seen them so quiet for the whole journey. Um, yet when we levelled out, the husband suddenly said, well, that's pommy drivers for you, which I think summed up the situation completely for me. <laughs> But overall, you would say that you're very lucky to oh, come to come out of it as you did. Quite right, Steve. Yes, I um, I think I'm very lucky. I've never been so petrified in my life, and I don't think until I actually die that I'll come so close to death. Mm. Well, apart from that incident, you had the emergency landing on only two engines, so that must have been fairly scary as well. Yes, it was. Um, every now and again, we'd glimpse lights from cities or small towns as we passed over them, um, and so we knew that we were getting very near the ground. And on our approach, we were being thrown around quite a lot in the air. And then eventually we made a surprisingly good landing on two engines. I think the two engines that were working were on just one side, which made the plane very unbalanced. So we did bounce a little when we landed, but surprisingly good landing. Of the hero, I mean, the captain was a real hero. Did everybody break out into applause at the end of that oh, landing? Oh, yeah, spontaneous applause, cheering, laughing. The relief on people's faces was a picture to see, it really was. After the tension suddenly broke... Yet, up to two days afterwards, I noticed in the passengers, people would suddenly burst in, into tears spontaneously, which is, must have been a delayed shock. For me, as soon as the incident was over, that was fine. Um, what happened when you landed at Jakarta? When we landed at Jakarta, we were greeted by happy-looking Indonesian officials who seemed rather surprised to see a great big jumbo jet suddenly dropping on their little air, air, airport. Um, there were emergency vehicles all over the runway pumping foam down. Um, obviously, this is strict procedure. Uh, they didn't have to inflate the safety chutes to get us off the aircraft because the engines had already be ex in it, been extinguished and I don't think there was much risk of fire after we'd landed. But uh, the plane was cleared very quickly um, and then we were taken by bus to the terminal where we awaited uh, departure to a hotel. Obviously the aircraft was completely unserviceable. Was a re replacement aircraft sent? Um, yes, a replacement aircraft was sent um, 36 hours later. Um, they did in fact send out replacement engines for the damaged aircraft in case it could be made airworthy um, but in fitting one of the engines they dropped it on the tarmac which was a million pounds down the drain straight away. How did you feel flying in, a, in an aircraft after such a terrifying experience? Well let me tell you we were all sitting in the departure lounge waiting to get onto our next aircraft and people's faces just said we don't want to fly again 
And British Airways obviously knew this, and so all the staff from the plane that was involved in the incident came into the departure lounge, followed by crates of beer and other spirits. And uh, there was a regular party. And um, this was very good PR work by British Airways because by the time we all got on the plane, we were all half drunk. Except for the odd ones who mightn't touch it. I think everybody touched it. (laughs) (laughs) Fine. And then you went on to Australia. Yes, I went on to Australia. It was another 11 hours to Perth. And then um, I landed in Melbourne a further three hours later. And while in Australia, just briefly, what did you do? I worked for a television station for a month um, doing work experience for my degree um, and had a very good time. And it wasn't marred that much by the incident, although it'll stay in my mind forever. I know it will, and it probably may deter other people from flying, but um, would you agree that flying would be one of the safest forms of transport available? I would. There was uh, the chief steward on the plane that was involved in the incident has been flying for 20 years, and he said that the last time he'd seen the oxygen mask, let alone any kind of incident, was seven years ago. So I would say it's a very safe way to fly. And I'd also say fly the flag because they're very good drivers. <laughs> Fine. Um, and just in closing, there was a, another incident two weeks later in the same or a similar cloud. Yes, there was. A Singapore Airlines jet hit a similar cloud lost two engines and had to make a forced landing in Jakarta. It wasn't quite as dramatic as the incident I was involved in, but it was a nasty event, I led to believe. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for talking to us, and we wish you luck in your media career and hope you don't have any more incidents such as you did have. Thank you. This is your captain speaking. We have a small problem. All our engines have stopped. We are doing our damnedest to get them working again. I trust you are not in too much distress. A report from Flight International magazine, the 4th of September, 1982. Captain Eric Moody, who nursed a British Airways Boeing 747 to safety after it lost all engine power in a cloud of volcanic ash, has received a certificate of commendation from the airline. Moody's cabin service officer, Graham Skinner, also received the award. He prepared the aircraft's passengers for an emergency landing as the aircraft glided powerless towards the sea. The interview with Bill Morris, broadcast on Manchester, England's Piccadilly Radio, was reviewed by Flight International magazine. Captain Eric Moody, who so calmly handled this major emergency, requested a copy of this interview along with world aviation medical experts.